Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the planet Earth, the John Campia Show. Coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, all sorts of good stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, he is Mr. Good Stuff, the one and the only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett is here, ladies and gentlemen. Robert, how are you doing today, sir? John, once again, it's a fine Monday. We had a fun weekend of football in Europe and movies opening and TV shows, and things are good, John. Things are good. Forza Italia. Italy won the Euro, uh, of course, tournament yesterday. I was watching it in the morning uh, with them. I was watching it new when it went on. England scored two minutes in, and then I had to leave to get ready to do our Black Widow. Uh, spoiler discussion yesterday, which is up and on the YouTube channel if you guys want to go watch that. And then it was like uh, near the end of the video, people started writing in, oh my God, they're going to penalty kicks in the live chat. And then Italy won. And then I had to go back and watch it afterwards. So yeah, it was pretty good to see. It was pretty good to see. By the way, our friend General Grievous sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, General Grievous. Well, guys, listen, it is awesome to have you guys here. And we have a number of things to talk about today. Here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to break the show into two parts as always. The first half of the show, we're going to take some predetermined topics. The second half of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you want to fire in a live comment or question to be read on this show or in an upcoming companion video, simply use the tip link that's in the description below, or you can enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com com slash movie blog tv slash tip you'll begin your comment or question read on the show if it's appropriate for the show and of course you'll be supporting the channel at the same time and all of us involved here at the john campia show thank you guys very much for your support okay guys with that down let's start things off here with an off the top and that off the top is this you know, Rob, one of the movies that uh, a lot of people have been talking about for a long time certainly carries with it a big nostalgia factor is Space Jam 2 or what is now known as Space Jam, A New Legacy. Now, I am a little bit in the minority of people that I was never all that big on the original Space Jam. Like, don't get me wrong. I didn't dislike the original Space Jam, but I, it's never hold, held that cult classic spot in my heart that it seems to have for a lot of people. I am also a big Le LeBron James fan. I'm a big LeBron James fan. But I, I saw the previews of uh, Space Jam 2 and all that kind of stuff. And even though I'm a big LeBron James fan, like for me, nothing about the trailers looked any good to me. Nothing looked compelling. I mean, it certainly looked like it would touch on those uh, nostalgia nerves that a lot of people like to have because of the original Space Jam. And that's cool. But honestly, as far as things on its own merit, nothing about it looked appealing to me. But a lot of other people seemed excited about it. And, and that's great. Well, the very first reviews for Space Jam have started coming out of Australia and New Zealand. Why they've seen it first, I don't know. But the first handful of reviews for Space Jam has started coming out of there, and we have our first kind of sense to it. It's sitting at 50%. Now, I'm going to tell you this. That's better than I thought. That's better than I thought. Now, you also have to keep in mind, this is only a couple of handful of reviews, like eight reviews coming out of Australia and New Zealand. But, you know, some of them are saying things like one of the top uh, Rotten Tomatoes critics from News.com in Australia, uh, When I Ma writes, it's hard not to feel like you've been swimming in some WB marketing executive's wet dream for two hours. Eh, that's not a positive thing. But at the same time, going to the other extreme, Dave Lee of Dave Lee Down Under, he writes, an absolute slam dunk. Uh, get it? Uh, slam dunk? Anyway. Loaded with Easter eggs, classic tune gags, and a butt and a punch of nostalgia. Fans of the original will have a blast, while new audiences will be blown away by the modern spectacle uh, as it moves. Uh, it's bigger and bolder direction. So, I mean, 50%, a couple of them really slamming on the movie. Some of them saying, hey, it's all right. And one or two are saying that they thought it was really good. And I'll be honest, this is right around where I thought it was going to be. Look, again, I'm not terribly excited for this movie. I will check it out, obviously. Uh, but yeah, this does nothing to increase my excitement. Rob, you're hearing these reviews now coming out. It's sitting at about 50%. Is that where you thought it would be? Do you think it would be higher or lower at this point? There are still a lot more reviews to come, obviously. And where's your particular anticipation level for Space Jam 2 right now? I, this might 
I don't know, be sacrilegious. I was not a big fan of the first Space Jam. Uh, I thought it was a bit of a mess. It was kind of all over the place. And I thought that, you know, I grew up watching things like the Looney Tunes, and I loved the creativity of those cartoons, and I just didn't think Space Jam lived up to that. Now, to be honest, I was pretty pretty uh, impressed just how many pop culture references and characters they jammed into that trailer. So I want to see this movie, but it's not surprising to me that it's only sitting at 50%. Because, you know, I, I want to see it just because I'm curious, but and I'll watch it, but I, I'm, you know, my level of excitement, John, to be honest, is just not very high. Yeah. <laughs> Can and I say I, that? Yeah, and, and as I said, look, it's at 50%, but that's only counting eight reviews only coming out of like Australia and New Zealand. So there's a lot more to come. We'll get a better idea about what the general consensus is here probably in the next couple of weeks. Question is for you guys. What do you think about uh, these couple of quick handful of reviews that are coming about? It was sitting at about 50%. Is that where you thought it would be? Do you think it would be higher? Do you think it would be lower? Where's your anticipation level for Space Jam, Space Jam 2? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move into our main topics here today. And how do we select our main topics here on the John Campy Show? Well, it's really rather simple. You see, you guys come up with our main topics. Whenever you come across a big topic, issue, or story that you think we need to cover as a main topic here on the John Campy Show, just go anytime 24-7 over to www.thejohncampyshow.com slash contact. Once you get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's absolutely free. Hit submit. And then maybe, just maybe, you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on the John Campia Show. And by the way, our friend RM sends in a Super Chat badge. And our friend My Comic Planet sends in like a $20 Super Chat badge in the live chat. Thank you so much, guys, for that. appreciate that very much. All right, guys. With that down, let's get into main topic number one. And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Chase Coley, who writes... With the amount of news we've gotten, it gets harder and harder to ignore the possibility of Toby and Andrew, that's Toby Maguire and Andrew Garfield, coming back for Spider-Man 3 or Spider-Man No Way Home. Do you guys think if they do return to their roles, that it will be at the expense of Tom's version and his character development? I personally feel like it will take away from our current iteration. I think it will also take away from the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man saying, and feeling. All right, thanks for sending that in, Chase. Now, of course, one of the big topics of discussion around movie fan circles the last number of months, hell, maybe even the last year, was the whispers and rumors and possibilities that maybe we'll see Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire pop up in Spider-Man No Way Home. To be very, very clear here, there has been absolutely zero credible news or evidence that either Tobey Maguire or Andrew Garfield will be appearing in Spider-Man No Way Home. There's been absolutely zero evidence, zero confirmation. That doesn't mean that they won't, though. Like, I still kind of believe they will, but I fully admit that belief right now isn't based on any credible evidence. Right. So maybe they will, maybe they won't, okay? So I kind of believe they will, but we'll see how it goes. It's an interesting question that's being brought up, that... Amongst all the talk about will or will not Andrew and Toby show up, we haven't really stopped to ask the question, should or should they not show up in it? And our viewer who writes in raises a very interesting question. Would Andrew Garfield and Toby Maguire appearing in a Spider-Man No Way Home, would it somehow, some way, detract from Tom Holland's Spider-Man? Would it somehow take away? Would it lessen? Would it make Tom Holland's, would it put Tom Holland's Spider-Man in a diminutive position where suddenly we look at him lesser instead of greater than? It's hard to say, but my opinion on it is this. I personally don't think that if, and that's a huge if, if Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire show up in this movie, I don't believe in any way, shape, or form it'll take away from Tom Holland's Spider-Man. If anything, I actually think it'll prop up Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Because I believe if John Watts, the director of this thing, is going to bring in these other Spider-Men, he knows his Spider-Man is Tom Holland. Tom Holland knows Tom Holland. John Watts knows that his Spider-Man is Tom Holland. And if he does bring in Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire... 
I believe this, Rob. I mean, I have no proof of this, but I'm going to go out on a limb and make a guess. Tom Watts will leverage Andrew Garfield Spider-Man and Tobey Maguire Spider-Man to, yes, bring in a nostalgia factor, to, yes, give some excitement to it. But I'm also telling you this. If he brings them in, he's bringing them in so that they can elevate Tom Holland Spider-Man. He ain't going to bring in those Spider-Men, somebody else's Spider-Man, to diminutize his Spider-Man. He's not going to do that. If anything, he's going to use them to highlight and elevate his Spider-Man. So I get the concern of our viewer, Rob, asking, hey, if they come in, is that going to take away from Tom Holland? You got to remember who's in charge of this thing and who's who's in the director's chair. If they're going to bring them in, he's going to bring them in to elevate his guy. So I don't think even if Toby and Andrew show up, which is certainly no guarantee they will, but even if they do, I personally don't think they'll do it in any such way that takes anything away from Tom Holland Spider-Man, who is the current, the reigning, the you know, uh, the definitive Spider-Man right now. So I don't think they're going to take away from him. Rob, it's an interesting question, and and one that we can't really definitively answer until the movie comes out, and if they're even in it. But if they are, Rob, do you think there's a danger that it'll take away from Tom Holland Spider-Man? Not really, because I think that's obviously would be a concern out of the gate that they wouldn't want to diminish their own Spider-Man. And I think that they probably, look, despite what people might say, I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we can all agree now, it's 24 films deep and three series. So we're at 27 shows. They've done a pretty good job of maintaining the integrity of their characters, and they're not going to want to diminish Tom Hall and Spider-Man. But I'll tell you something. All we have to do is, I think, look to into the Spider-Verse. I mean, even though they had all these different iterations of Spider-Man, really the heart and soul of that movie was Miles Morales. And I think no matter what they do, as far as, let's say, Tom Holland is surrounded by Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, I think they would probably use Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield to prop up Tom Holland Spider-Man the same way that the other Spider-Men worked really well, like Nicolas Cage's version and... and um, uh, I, I I think that it, it would do nothing except accentuate what's going on because they don't want to. And you know what? They need to keep Tom Holland as an actor happy as well. They wouldn't want him to feel that his character is being slighted. I bet you that it's all if they do that, I think the movie's going to be a lot of fun and uh, it won't. It won't diminish the MCU Spider-Man in any way, shape or form. I don't think they would allow that to happen. Yeah. Now, of course, that leaves us still with the big question about whether we are even going to get Tom Holland or Andrew Garfield in the movie. And I, th I think that's still a bit of a coin toss. I kind of believe they will be. But again, no credible, no credible evidence yet that they actually are. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. Let's assume for a moment that Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire do appear in the film. Do you think their presence by definition takes away from Tom Holland or do you think it actually accentuates Tom Holland? What do you guys think about it? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move on to main topic number two. Rob, what is our second main topic today? Well, John, very topical. It comes from David Banks. Hi, John and crew. I hope you're doing well. Oh, we are. Although I haven't played the games or read the books, I really enjoyed Netflix's The Witcher, and I've been waiting for season two. Well, we now have a release date for December 17th. What are your thoughts? Well, it says tights, but what are your thoughts on The Witcher Season 2 finally having a release date? Uh, well, first of all, I have to say, I thought the trailer looked great. Uh, it, I mean, intriguing. I, I, I'm a sucker, John, for stories where our main character mentors somebody else. You know, I think that there's a character dynamic that's inherent, uh, that's inherently interesting, especially when that person happens to be a beautiful woman that's always good too <laughs> so it looked good to me um and then uh, we go on and it says gizmodo from gizmodo it says in season two on the hunt for the missing Geralt takes siri to the ancestral home of the witcher's school of the wolf K.R. morhen the same hollowed institute where Geralt once learned under the guidance of mentor vesemir played by kim Bod uh, bodnet Bodnia, Bodnia this season, and the subject of his own spin-off anime film next month, which look, also looks cool, The Ways of Monster Hunting. But as the world goes to hell, <laughs> and all around them, across the continent, the various human kingdoms, the elves and the monsters themselves are... 
quickly discovers that the most dangerous threat of all for Siri may be the powerful magic that runs deep inside her. Magic that only someone as talented as Yennefer could help Siri temper. Well, dude, I don't know, man. All of this sounds great to me. It's exactly the kind of thing I love in fantasy stories. You've got human and character drama and the threat of an apocalypse that's going to consume everybody. What do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, I loved season one of Witcher. Absolutely loved it. Their mechanic of the story mechanics they used of telling their story, where mm. the season starts off looking like they are telling one part of the story and then at the same time this other part of the story is going on and you think they're all happening at the same time but it isn't until you get further into season that you realize wait a minute these are happening completely out of time order and when I realized that I remember I I stopped the show and I turned I went and got Anne because she wasn't watching it with me yet at the time and like freaking out it's like Oh my God, you got to see what they did here. And I'm explaining to her how they were telling the story one way and you thought this was happening concurrently at the same time, but it wasn't. And it was, it was just a storytelling dynamic that I'm sure has been done before, but I don't recall ever seeing that sort of mechanic done before. So they didn't just rely on, this is a popular video game. They didn't right. just rely on, this is a popular IP that everybody will dig and all that kind of stuff. They actually did some really innovative stuff with the storytelling. And obviously, you got my my bro crush, uh, Henry Cavill, in this thing at the same time. And he was fantastic. Uh, all the, the characters did well. I forget the name of the actress who played Yennefer. I mean, we joke a lot like about how, wow, Yennefer sure loves being naked. Because <laughs> she's naked a lot in this show. It, uh, but, Anya, Anya uh, Chalotra? Is that, is that her name? name? Yeah. I, I, I can't remember. But honestly, that joke aside, she was tremendous. Yeah. In this and the chemistry that her and Cavill were able to maintain is great. So I've been looking forward to this a great deal to see, you know, Cavill back. So it was great to see the trailer. And I thought the trailer was great. I did. I, I think the trailer was wonderful. I'm not going to lie. While it is exciting to see that we have a release date, I was really hoping it was going to be a lot sooner. Uh, I mean, I, I get it. December's not so far away. It's only, what, like six months away now, five months. We're in July, August, September, October, November. We're five months away. Okay. It's not a terrible long time. But I was really kind of hoping to see, when I saw that the trailer came up, I was kind of hoping to see coming this September or all that or something like that. I was really hoping to see it a little bit earlier. But I'm down for this. The story sounds great. It, it looks the aesthetic and the feel of it. The DNA feels like it's a great continuation from season one. And I just can't wait for it. Anyway, the question is for you guys. Did you guys have a chance to see this new promo spot for Witcher Season 2? It's coming out in December. How did you feel about it? Did you like it? Did it let you down a little bit? Were you kind of surprised it's coming when it is? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let me know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number three. And our third main topic today Get submitted to us by Juan B, who writes, Greetings, John and team. So Disney has reported their opening weekend figures for Black Widow with a massive $215 million opening weekend when you include an impressive $60 million from Disney Premier Access. Given the success for both the theater box office numbers and Disney Premier Access numbers, do you think Disney will reevaluate their big tentpole film releases and have some type of coexistence between the theaters and Disney Premier Access? All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yes, so some great news and some tempered expectations. Now, of course, when we were heading into this weekend, they were projecting initially that I think Black Widow would hit somewhere between 65 and 80. Then those projections went up to like 70 to 90. And then when Black Widow nearly doubled the opening night numbers of F9, all of a sudden $100 million opening weekend, despite the fact that it was also going to be premiering on Disney Plus for an extra $30. A lot of people started to believe, I really was starting to buy more into it as well, that a $100 million opening weekend was a possibility. Now, of course, that didn't happen. It did make $80 million, breaking the new post-COVID opening weekend box office record that Fast 9 held. Fast 9 made $70 million at the box office, whereas Black Widow's officially opening weekend box office numbers was 80. So it beat it by $10 million. Very impressive, especially when you consider that Fast 9 only opened in theaters, whereas Black Widow was also available on 
Disney uh, uh, Disney Plus, their special $30 premiere thing. Now, a lot is being made about the $60 million that it made on premiere. And it's good, but it you also got to remember this. That $60 million only accounts for, that just means 2 million households rented it. Mm-hmm. 2 million. It's not like 20 million homes rented it. 2 million homes rented it. The numbers that they're giving was, I don't know where the hell they got these numbers or how the hell they calculated it, but they're guessing 3.8, Rob, 3.8 people per home watched it, (laughs) which means if you extrapolate that over the average of $12 uh, ticket price, Disney actually lost money on this deal, but, but whatever it made $60 million and that's a win for being out on Disney plus premiere. But does that mean Disney should be popping bottles? Well, not necessarily. We'll talk about the box office result in a second, but let's let's actually look at Disney, their Premiere Plus. Black Widow is now the fourth film. And remember, I think they're going to do five or six more of these, Rob. I think at minimum, they're going to do five or six more of these. They need a good size sample to really see how this is working out for them. But right now, Black Widow is the fourth film that they put out on Premiere Access. And Black Widow is the first film that Disney came out publicly and let people know what their numbers are. And the reason that this one was the first film they came out publicly to let people know what the numbers are is because this is the first time they're not embarrassed by what the numbers are. Because as we go back and look at this stuff, this is the fourth film that they've put out, all right? They put out Mulan. They never released official numbers, but myself and everybody else in the industry heard that the numbers for Premiere Plus were abysmal, like absolutely abysmal. Then they did the same thing with Raya and the Last Dragon. And again, every I wasn't the only one. Everybody in the industry heard that the numbers for Raya and the Last Dragon on Disney Plus Premier Access were absolutely terrible. Then came Cruella. Cruella overall did pretty disappointing numbers considering how good the movie is. Because it's, 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 Cruella's a very good movie. But again... All indication that I heard coming out of Disney was that the Disney Plus premiere rental numbers were terrible. And just like the previous two, Disney was so embarrassed by the numbers, they didn't publicly release them. Now comes Black Widow. And Rob, all it took was for the first MCU movie in two years for Disney to finally have a premier access thing that they weren't completely embarrassed and humiliated by the financial results. And they were good. This one is absolutely a win. Black Widow gets the green check mark. But again, this is just like everything else. When Mulan was a failure and everybody said they should ditch it, we would say, hold on, hold on, slow your roll. This is just one. You got to give it a lot more to see how it averages out. Then when Raya came out and failed, it's like, wait a minute, it's, it's, this is still too small a sample size. Then when Cruella came out and didn't get the numbers they wanted on Disney+, Plus, again, we said, hold on, this is they still got to do this a number of times. I mean, I, I think obviously not people aren't really jumping on this as much as Disney hoped, but still they need a lot more, a bigger sample size to see. So with Black Widow being a success, I repeat, don't get too far ahead of yourselves. This is one out of four. This is one out of four, so don't get too excited. Uh, Rob, I still believe the jury is out for how well Disney Premium, uh, Disney Plus's Premier Access is going to do. It's still too small a sample size. But again, I wouldn't be popping bottles if I was Disney Plus right now because they're one for four, and it actually took, for them to finally get their first real big win with this, it literally took the first Marvel Cinematic Universe movie in two years for them to hit it. So a win, absolutely. Good numbers, absolutely. But let's, just like I was saying, don't, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves when the first couple failed. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because one finally succeeded. What I'm really interested in, Rob, is to see how they're doing the same thing with Jungle Cruise soon. And I'm going to be really interested to see how Jungle Cruise does. Will Mm. Jungle Cruise get number? Will Disney actually come out and publicly let people know what the numbers were for Jungle Cruise? I'm guessing they won't. But... I mean, if Jungle Cruise can follow this up and also, say, do like a $50, 60000000 home rental thing, 
Well, well, then you got to say that the Disney Plus home premium rentals are trending in the right direction of that thing. But it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. As far as the box office goes, Rob, listen, if the amount of people who watch it at home actually saw it in theaters, you're talking about a movie that probably made a, would have made a $160, $170 million opening weekend, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But still, $80 million. Whereas Fast 9 had a very impressive $70 million with no home viewing option. People had a home viewing option for Black Widow and it still made $80 million opening weekend. I think even though it didn't hit that $100 million number a lot of us were talking about, I still think that's a really impressive number for where we are right now in coming out of the COVID situation. Rob, you look at this $80 million opening weekend, $60 million uh, Disney premiere. What's your evaluation of this whole thing? Well, you know, obviously I didn't hit my $100 million mark that I thought it was going to hit, you know, but I will say this. What's really interesting to me is to have a $60 million revenue stream from their premium, the Disney Plus premium, and the, the, the fact that they announced it, that they said we made $60 million bucks plus our $80 million opening, that's significant to me in that both seem to be working. Now, you know, collectively, that's $140 million. If you could open a movie and make that much, because the revenue stream that they make, that that 60 million bucks, most of it's going to go directly to Disney. They don't have to, there's no revenue sharing there. So that's a pretty big number. Whereas if it was a theatrical number, you know, they get half, maybe? 30%. 30%. So they get 30%. Well, D Disney gets G Disney gets 65 to 70%. Theaters keep around 30%. Yeah, depending on what the what the deal is, but still they're not sharing that revenue. So I would say that it it shows that both can be viable. That you can you can you can open a movie in theatrically and and at the same time keep that that I mean that's significant. That's big money. So I'm wondering is it going to be viable moving forward that we're going to see this being the norm that that these movies, these big movies, at least the Disney films are going to do both, that they're not going to go back to a theatrical only model. They're going to keep their premier access model along with a theatrical model. And it, I think this I mean, obviously, they're going to have to be able to do this with multiple movies, but you've got Shang-Chi and Eternals coming. So are they going to follow this same model? And, and it's going to be interesting to see how will this affect the theatrical business moving forward and is eventually the premier access going to overtake theatrical? I, I, think it's, I think the reason that Disney decided this is the first time anyone's really released numbers after the first, certainly the first time Disney has, it's because it's, it's significant. They're making a statement by doing it. And I think uh, it might definitely signal a game change as far as what we're used to. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how, how, how it continues moving forward. I, again, I, I don't think you can ignore though, what the overall record is right now, because the overall record right now is, is one, they're one for four because their results for the Mulan premiere release were embarrassing. Their results for the Raya release were embarrassing. Their results for the Corello release were embarrassing. So much so that they didn't release the numbers, they kept it quiet, but all the inside, everybody in the industry knows, that we've all been told that they were actually really, really disappointing numbers they got from those. And then Black Widow comes, the first MCU movie in two years. And if you do, and the other thing you got to take into consideration here, Rob, is that there are a number of countries that refuse to play Black Widow in cinemas because of the day and date release. We've had been having a number of our viewers writing in from certain countries saying we don't have the option to watch it here because Disney doing a day and date release on Disney Plus, our theaters here are not showing their movies. So they have, they, I think when you actually add it all up, they probably took a net loss on this. For now, the question is going to be, does Black Widow indicate an upward trend or is Black Widow just kind of a flash in the pan because it's the first Marvel Cinematic Universe movie in over two years? And I think Jungle Cruise will tell us the answer to that. Because if Jungle Cruise comes out and Disney once again goes, shh, let's not tell people how much it didn't make in Disney premium home release, then we'll right. see that there is no trend. But... 
at the on the opposite side of the coin, if Jungle Cruise comes out and they come out, like obviously nobody expects Jungle Cruise to make as much as Black Widow. But if Jungle Cruise can come out and Disney comes out and says Jungle Cruise made fifty million dollars on Disney Plus Premium Rental, well, that to me, see that to me would be far more significant than Black Widow making sixty, far more significant because it would to me that then actually shows there is an upward trend, but. If it comes out and they don't release the numbers and word is that they they are disappointed with it, well, then that doesn't mean that Blackwood really meant anything. It's going to be interesting to see what the overall math is on this because, yeah, they made $60 million, but how much would they have made had it been just theatrical only? They would have had more international markets that wouldn't have boycotted the movie. Those 3.8 people that watched it per household would have equaled more money at the box office than they got on the home rental. But again, if it can trend the other way, we'll have to see. Again, I want to just make sure we all keep in mind, they're one for four right now. They're one for four. This is not a winning record yet. Yet. I still think we need to see four, five, six more of these come out before we're able to really give any real sort of evaluation. But I'm going to be very, very curious to see what Jungle Cruise does. Either way, the $80 million, Rob, of, of, an, of an opening when... Fast 9, which had a very good opening at $70 million and had no home option, Black Widow did have the home option and it still was able to make 80. I think this tells us people have been really excited and really waiting for the MCU to hit the big screen again. I, I don't know. What what kind of commentary do you take from that? Well, I, look, I, I think, f- first of all, I think it's a win all the way around. I mean... As it stands, that's still a hundred and forty million dollars of revenue coming out of the pandemic, and I think that we're going to see more and more of this, and I think it's good for the business, you know. And and ultimately, it leaves me optimistic that people still want their movies, people still want the MCU, and uh, I just love that that one. I love people are still getting entertained. I love that big budget fantasy epics are still th- still something people want to see and indeed probably need and it it leaves me optimistic about the future of of movie going and movie watching and streaming because it also shows me that people will pay a premium price to see something that they're interested in seeing i mean 30 bucks bruh that's uh that's expensive especially when you're buying it from a streaming service that you normally get stuff for free from and nobody seemed to have uh, a problem dropping that green. Well, at least what two million households didn't. But I, I'm, I am optimistic about this. I think it's a good result. But like you said, John, and astutely so, let's see if this happens again and again and again. This could be a fluke. But if they can keep this up, if Shang Chi and Eternals, uh, if Disney gets the same result, I, I think it's something that we can look at and be happy about. Well, remember, right now, Shang-Chi and, and Eternals aren't scheduled to be on Disney Premier Access. I, I know. I'm curious, That's... though. To, the reason I'm really curious about Jungle Cruise is this, is because is the only time Disney can be successful at this is when it's one of the world's biggest movies. Like when it's an MCU theatrical release, a highly anticipated one. Is that the only time this model works? Or can it work when another Cruella comes out, because it didn't work with the first Cruella. Can it work when Jungle Cruise comes out, because it didn't work with Ryan the Last Dragon? Can it work when it's not, you know, one of the projected to be one of the biggest movies in the world? Can it, or will it only work when it's one of those movies? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. I think we, we need a much bigger sample size to see where we go. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. What do you think about all this? I think whichever way you cut it, for now, it's pretty impressive results for Disney. I think they got to be happy with it all the way around. How do you guys feel about this? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on and start taking your live comments and questions, shall we? And once again, if you want to get a live comment or question on the show, simply use the tip link that's down in the description below to get it on either this show or an upcoming companion video. You can just click on it there, or you can enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. Once again, you're supporting our channel, and thank you very much for that. And if your question or comment is appropriate for our show, you'll see it right on this show or in the upcoming companion video. All right, guys. Let's move into it now. And we're going to get things started off here with Brenda Strong, who writes, Hi, beautiful John. Well, hello. Uh, To me, Loki is the best show, hands down. 
But as we keep speculating, it seems that the MCU Disney Plus formula is going to end up with a Loki variant as the big bad. I'm just not going to fall for this BS again. There will be no Kang. Watch XOXO. Well, see, here's the funny thing, Rob. I think people are comparing the wrong things. When people are talking about the possibility of Kang, they keep comparing it to WandaVision's Mephisto. Right. And of course, Mephisto never shown. But that's the wrong comparison. What they should be comparing this to, and what this is much more like, is to Agatha in WandaVision. Because just like in WandaVision, all the signs were pointing that Catherine Hahn's character was actually Agatha Harkness. And people like me were saying, nah, it's way too obvious that it's Agatha Harkness. Therefore, it's not going to be Agatha Harkness. But, of course, it did turn out to be Agatha Harkness. You shouldn't be trying to compare the Kang situation to Mephisto. You should be comparing it to Agatha because that's really, those are the ones that are running parallel to each. Those are the ones that have the most similarities. And, of course, in WandaVision, it did end up being Agatha. Of course, the question is, is it going to be Kang? Rob, I've gone from thinking it's a 33% chance it's going to be Kang, 33% chance it's going to be a Loki variant, 33% chance it's going to be anybody else. After the last episode, I have moved to, I believe there's an 80% chance it's going to be Kang, a 15% chance that it's going to be Loki, a Loki variant, and a 5% chance it'll be anybody else. So I really believe it's going to be Kang. I think there's a decent possibility it could still be a Loki variant and a tiny, tiny possibility that's anybody else. Where are you right now on that? Well, you know, the show is about Loki, and I think what's really been interesting about these three shows is in a way they've all been about people dealing with their emotions, you know, grief or they're coming to grips with who they are. And I think that having Kang show up at the end would be like, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're going to introduce the, one of the most powerful and uh, celebrated villains in the Marvel comic universe in the last episode of the show. And he hasn't had anything to do with the show up until this point. I think it probably absolutely would be another Loki variant. All all things point to that. And it's going to be the final, whatever happens, our Loki, quote unquote, our Loki, the 2012 Avengers Loki that we've been following through this, our variant, is going to make the final realization or he's going to have the final understanding of, of the process of self-realization or actualization that he's been going through this during the series. And um, I, I, I think it probably has to be the ultimate version of Loki because otherwise, what, what would the show be about? You know, it would take the focus off our main character. So I think by having a final Loki variant, there's going to be some revelation here, uh, would be kind of the point of the show. And we know that Kang's going to be in quantum mania. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe the variant Loki will give us the, whatever the, 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 I don't know what you'd call him. The ringmaster of all this, the man at the end of time, that Loki variant might introduce the idea of Kang, but I don't think that Kang himself is going to be revealed as the big bad. By the way, I think yellow in the live chat just gave us the best theory. It's going to be Gary Busey, Gary Busey. They say in the live chat, is going to be the big bad at this thing, which I would, I would die if they did something. The like that. leaders of Chronopolis <laughs> are surfers. <laughs> A little bit of uh, point break there for you. All right, next up, uh, we got James L.H. who writes, Hey, John, one of two. A few weeks ago, I messaged uh, in that Italy being the opening match in the Euros. I also said that if they face England, they have to lose. Well, it, my if has happened. It's an England v. Italy final. Obviously, this came in before the match yesterday. Uh, first time in my lifetime, England in the final. John, there's still hope for your Leafs after waiting so long. I just hope the final doesn't get interrupted by soldiers landing in the middle of the pitch. Ah, a little bit of Tomorrow War there for you. Uh, via a portal from the future. Yes, I've seen and did enjoy Tomorrow War despite some problems and uh, by the way our friend hulk b85 in the live chat sends in a super chat badge thank you hulk um sorry to break it to you but italy did win the match so there you go uh it was it was surreal for me i think it's the first time that italy won the euro since like the 60s so it's been a long time now i i don't generally watch soccer to be completely honest with you but when it's the world cup 
or one of the major tournaments in Italy's in it, then then I have to you know tune in and pay attention to it. Anyway, thanks for sending that in, James L. H. It's good. It was good to see England in the finals there. All right, Willow writes. I'll be very curious to see what a Hamilton feature film will look like. I assume that they will follow the play in terms of casting. Does being a musical give more leeway to the race swapping of well-known historical characters? I don't know if being a, a musical does that. What I love about the way they did the casting for Hamilton, and by the way, uh, Victor Watson sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Victor. See, some people, Rob, think that, oh, they 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 cast it with a lot of black actors and Latino actors because there was, it's a lot of rap and hip-hop in it and stuff like that. I don't think that's it at all. I think people who think that are missing the point. The point of that casting was to really drive home the message of America. And I, as a Canadian, watching Hamilton on the live, I got to go to the Pantages and watch it live. Watching it live, like it, it allows you to transcend the idea about the formation of America and what built America and the principles on which America was built. And by having like a predominantly black cast, it allowed you to see past race and it allowed you to look at it as a country, as this is the story of America. And on that level, as a novelty, and it is a novelty, but sometimes novelty can be an incredibly powerful thing. I think that's ultimately why Lin-Manuel Miranda did that, and I think it worked incredibly well, and it's very, very powerful. So uh, I see that. But I know, Rob, do you think it being a musical makes you know the, the race swapping and stuff like that more palatable or easier with the fact that it's a musical? I don't, but maybe you do. What do you think? Well, I think a musical immediately says that this is a heightened reality, you know, that we're not in the real, the quote-unquote real world. And I think that because something's immediately a fantasy, it it does make it a little bit more palatable that you can look. I remember seeing The Wiz when I was a kid, which is basically the black version of The Wizard of Oz. I loved it. I saw it like five times. I kept going back to the theater. I love like the song. It's time to ease on down, ease on down the road. I loved it. And it never occurred to me that it was supposed to be. I mean, I saw it as its own thing because. It was a musical. You know, I was I opened my mind in, in a way like I never thought it was the Black Wizard of Oz. I just thought it was, even though it was it was just the whiz to me, you know, and, and I, I think that for whatever reason, we we give a pass to things that are musical. You know, right. that it doesn't have to be because, you know, you think of something like Camelot, uh, the musical <laughs> Camelot, you know, you've got Excalibur, which to me, even though that's a total fantasy. Uh, is this hard hitting, gritty, bloody thing? But then you make Camelot and everyone's singing, then it's like, oh, <laughs> it's not so bad. It's it's all good. <laughs> so I, I think I think so. The answer, John, I think yes. I think musicals make people a little bit more open minded. All right. Next up. We've got Michael Evans who writes, Hey, John, well, it actually happened. England are playing Italy in the Euro. Obviously, this is before yesterday's final. Uh, are playing Italy in the Euro 2020 finals at Wembley on Sunday at 8 p.m. GMT. England's first major final in 55 years. Sorry, John, but football's coming home. I'll allow you a moment to rethink that. Uh, football's coming home. If not, then I'll give Monday show a miss. There you go. But yeah, listen, it was great to see two tr such traditional soccer powerhouses playing in the in, in the end there. And it went down to penalties. By the way, I, one of the reasons I don't watch soccer all that much is deciding a game on penalty kicks, I believe, is ridiculous, especially in a big, important tournament. Like in NHL, Rob, when it's the playoffs... You don't go to penalty shots on the playoffs. You play the game until somebody wins. You play the game until somebody wins. It doesn't matter yep. if it takes an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. You play the game until somebody wins. And I think in these major things, I, I think you, I really hate the idea of having it be decided on penalty kicks. I mean, hey, yay, Italy won, but I, it, I, it's a, it feels a little hollow to me. That's just me, though. All right, next up. We got B Wayne, New York writes, John Robb. So, like you guys, the first time I heard about the Seinfeld Pop Tart movie, it sounded ridiculous. But I recently watched a History Channel series called Corporation Food Wars, including the bitter rivalry between CW Post in Kellogg's. Uh, it was, guys, please don't short form your words. Please just write them out. Anyway, uh, it was fascinating. The film could work. Well, listen, it is going to be a straight up comedy, though. It's going to be a little bit of history, a whole bunch of comedy. And listen, of course it could work. 
if a Lego movie, a movie about plastic square building blocks, can work with the right script and the right story and the right execution, then any concept can work. And with Seinfeld doing it, I don't know. I think it's, there's, there's some interesting things there, B-Wayne. We'll see how it goes. All right, next up, Tom Gillard writes, After 23 movies in the MCU, they finally made one that I don't like in Black Widow. I thought it was a piss poor movie with a few redeeming qualities. First, Wonder Woman 84 and now Black Widow. If you need me, I'll be crying in the corner hugging my Endgame Blu-ray. You know, the funny thing is, Rob, I I still liked, I, I still quite liked Black Widow. I did. Obviously, I, I think the biggest weakness in the film were the terrible villains. Like, I thought Taskmaster ended up being just a complete throwaway thing. Even the Ray Winstone character was like, oh, so you're like another Hydra? You're, you, oh, you, you've already infiltrated all the high levels of things in the world. You're just another Hydra. I thought the, the villainous stuff was so terrible. And that stuff is really important in these types of action movies. But I thought everything else worked quite well. I thought the action sequences were quite solid. I love the chemistry of the characters. I love David Harbour in this. Like I've, I've said before, I'll watch a, a Red Guardian movie any day of the week. But Rob, I'm going to make a video about this later. And I, just let me drop this on you right now and get your initial quick impression because I'm thinking about making a video about this later. This is the first time, maybe ever for me, that I have now watched three MCU properties in a row and I didn't love any of them. Uh, I loved WandaVision, but after WandaVision, we got Falcon of the Winter Soldier and I liked Falcon of the Winter Soldier, but I didn't love it. I, I liked it quite a bit, but I didn't love it. Then, you know, we're in the midst of Loki. And right now, I like Loki, but I don't love it. But I like it. Thumbs up for me. Black Widow, thumbs up for me. I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. And that's the first time ever that I've gone three MCU properties in a row that I didn't love. And I cannot help but wonder, Rob, and worry a little bit that back when Marvel was making three movies a year, it's like every movie got to get a lot of attention. Kevin Feige was able to be more hands-on with all of them. Every detail and every T cross and I dotted was given better scrutiny. And they were just all really well put together individual things. Not that every single thing Marvel put together was fantastic. But for the most part, their bar of excellence was really high. I am worried now that they're just cranking out so much content like on an assembly line. Because we've got like... 17 pieces of MCU content in the next two years coming. I'm a little bit worried that we're going to start to see a quality drop overall, because when you just start mass producing these things, your quality is going to drop. And right now, like I said, I I'm, I'm now three MCU things in, in a row where while I like them, they're not living up to MCU standards for me. I, I, I don't know, Rob, what do you think about that? I think that, um, well, look, one of the things I think about the MCU shows that we've gotten so far, that want, beginning with WandaVision, is they're really interesting to me. And I thought WandaVision was completely out there. And what I happened loved was- it. Loved WandaVision. Yeah, it was just out there and wacky. And we, we, um, we, <laughs> I, I I just was watching it the whole time going, who came up with this craziness? And yet, you know, with all the speculation that happened, I think people might have felt a little bit of disappointment at the end of it. Like it was a little too conventional for what we'd seen. But I still thought I was like, wow, this is all pretty, pretty incredible. And I really enjoyed Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I mean, I thought that the central question, which was Sam Wilson not thinking that he was worthy of the mantle of Captain America and over the course of the show coming to realize that he was worthy. Well, that was, that's a great story. And I, I, I felt if I was, you know, reading that in the comic form, like in a, as a mini series, I would really have liked it. Now we know they had to rejigger some things during the, during the pandemic. Like there was actually a pandemic story in that, in the, in it. So they had to change that around, but I still liked it a lot. Loki I feel really is out there. I, I feel that it might have gone a little too far, that the whole TVA and introducing all of this stuff is so out there that it really has broken through the wall of credibility or believability in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because it's opened up some really extreme wacky possibilities. However, I want to see where it goes. 
But I don't think the quality has been lacking. I just don't think they've been as satisfying as, say, Infinity War or Winter Soldier you know, or Guardians of the Galaxy 1 because they've been doing different kinds of things than we've come to expect. But to me, they're still really interesting and they're pushing the boundaries and they're doing something unexpected. Um, I don't think there's too much of it. I just think they're doing it differently because this is their this is pu- them pushing into um, television. But I found it to be fascinating to watch. All right, next up, we've got where are we now? We are at LGP Vintage Toys Rights. Uh, why are there only human-like workers at the TVA? You would expect non-human beings like from all over the galaxy working at the TVA. This is a question that's come up like a thousand times. It's because that's just what sci-fi has always done. It's like, wait a minute, why is this alien Vulcan race that's completely from a different solar system and everything, why do they look exactly like humans except for with slightly different eyebrows and point? That's just because that's what sci-fi has always done. It just it makes it easier to shoot, number one, but number two just makes it more relatable for the majority of the audience. So really, it's not much more beyond that. Rob had a great theory, too, as well, that probably if you're from another world, you would probably see the TVA members as your own species at the same time, which I, I thought that was an interesting theory. But it just goes, that's just the way that, you know, sci-fi has always done it. It's either everything's human, everybody speaks English, or everything looks really, really close to human. It's just a classic sci-fi thing to do. All right, next up, uh, Kurt writes, Hello, John and crew. What is your definition of a working actor? I was watching an interview with an actress that mentioned they aren't Meryl Streep, they're a working actor. Uh, it's an actor that isn't still trying to make it big, or is it something else? Well, it's, it, Rob, it, it's one of those things where it depends on the semantics. It might mean something different to everybody. Some people will define a working actor as like a character actor, right? They're not the leads in anything. They just go, they just work in a lot of films, and they show up in different roles and stuff like that, but they're never the name you recognize, you know? David Morse, I think, is one of the greatest, the late, great Brian Dennehy was like one of the great examples. Him, David Morse, guys like that, who are never like the main featured headline guy, but they will pop up in a lot of different movies and a lot of different types of roles and stuff like that. And some people define that as working actor or character actor or whatever, but there's no real solid definition of it. Um, I don't know, Rob, how would, if somebody were to ask you, what's a working actor or what's a character actor, how would you define that to them? Uh, A character actor is somebody that to me uh, is not the lead. He's not the, or she's not the, the, the main star of the show but shows up in a, not necessarily a supporting role, but a supporting, supporting role. You know, (laughs) like somebody who takes on, if it's a murder mystery, they might be the assistant to the main cop. You know, they're, they're, they, they support the supporting role of the film. And, you know, a lot of actors make a, a whole career out of being what they call character actors, where they show up doing a a secondary or, or, or maybe even a third string role, but that doesn't mean they're any, they're, they're any less important. I mean, uh, a great, a great actor, a great character actor can make an indelible impression on you. Um, uh, even though that they're not the lead. And I think like a, a great character actor can be like the murderer on a CSI show. They yeah. show up and they're like the leading guest star for that episode. They're only going to be there for one episode, but you know that actor because they've shown up in so many different things. So they're still like, like they're not the lead of the show. Like it's not William Peterson, but it's the lead bad person of that particular episode. That could be a character actor. All right. Uh, I, I, I need to address this as quickly because this is important. Um, one of our users in a live chat, uh, uh, Akash Joji's reaction says Toby Maguire and Andrew Garfield and Spider-Man is kind of confirmed. Listen, please stop misusing words. They are not confirmed. Uh, if something does not come from a legitimate news site, and when I say legitimate news site, I mean the real legitimate news sites, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Deadline, The Wrap, you know, uh, Entertainment Weekly. If it doesn't come from actually the studio itself or somebody directly connected to the studio, or from one of the legitimate news sites, it is not confirmed. It doesn't mean it can't be possible. It doesn't mean it can't be true. But please stop misusing words like confirmed, because that is not true. It is absolutely not true. Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, while I believe they will be in Spider-Man 3, 
It is absolutely wrong and false to say that it is confirmed they are in there. Please don't spread misinformation like that around because it's just simply not true. Okay, let's move on with that. Uh, let's move on. Next up, uh, Jimbo T. Byrne writes, Remember these words, John. Episode 6 of Loki, Kang is the big bad guy, and the climax of the show is Kang agreeing to end the TVA, and Loki and Sylvie agree to work with Kang moving forward as a bargain to both be spared. Uh, no. I, look, I, I am leaning towards that the big baddie is Kang. I'm definitely leaning towards that. But Rob, it seems to me with all the character development for Loki that this show has done, to end it with him going, fine, I agree to work for the big bad guy. I don't see, that just seems really inconsistent to me with the rest of the show. I, I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I just think that, you know, introducing Kang, you'd have to explain so much about who Kang is and where he's coming from because non-comic book audiences don't know who Kang is. And to just have somebody of that, of that importance to the Marvel comic universe with that kind of backstory. How do you make that? How do you do that effectively? Introduce him as the big bad, explain who he is, explain what he wants, and then tie him into the previous five episodes. I think it's tough. How do we do that? They kind of did it for Agatha. I mean, nobody knows who Agatha was at all. And they kind of just, but, in the she, last... was in, but she was in the whole series from the beginning. Yes, but so nobody we... knew who she was. Like no. she was in it as somebody else entirely. Like it could just be that they just introduce Kang, you know, that the ending of the series brings a closure to Loki's story progression. And because really this show isn't about whoever the big bad guy is. This show is about Loki and his character journey. And so they can finish that off and then use that finale to also introduce us to Kang for moving forward in the MCU. And it's our first little introduction to him. But you are right. You can't introduce him, give us his full backstory, has set up a big conflict with Loki, and then bring that conflict all to resolution in 45 minutes. I mean, that they can't do. And that, to me, is the biggest argument for why the second option of another Loki variant is still very much on the table. So... It'll be interesting to see how they handle that. All right, next up. Uh, let's see, Ryan Loner writes, Hopefully the Witcher crew sends a note with the early review copies. Please watch every episode. Oh, I know what this is about. I can't believe I have to say that either, but here we are. So, Rob, I can't remember the outlet. I, can't rem I feel bad saying Forbes because maybe it wasn't Forbes. But I don't even remember this, but I think it was, I think it was the Witcher where it was Forbes who put out this big review that... I, and it might have been Witcher, it might have been a different series, but I think it was Witcher season one, that they put out this review that this show is terrible. The show's terrible and it's awful and blah, blah, blah. But it turns out that the reviewer had only watched two episodes. They had only watched two episodes. And it, it would have been fine if their headline line was, uh, this show episode one and two were terrible. Okay, that's fine. But they actually put out this full review of the series when the whole series was available to them to watch. And it turned out they only saw like two episodes and didn't watch the rest. And right. that, it was for the, I'm being reminded by people in the live chat, including Dominic Martinez. They're saying, yes, it was a was Witcher. And Eric is saying in the live chat that, yes, it was Forbes. Okay. So yeah. And I remember I, we, you and I did a big video about this. Like, come on. Like that, that was such Bush league. And you're right, Ryan Loner. They should attach a note that says, Hey, if you're going to review this, at least watch the whole thing before you review it, please. Like do your fucking job. You hack. Anyway. There's that. All right. Next up. Always sketchy writes and tips in like $20. Thank you. Always sketchy for supporting our channel on that level, man. Uh, hey, John, I think we all know who's Loki, who Loki's own worst enemy has been himself. Uh, so is he just going to finally defeat his own worst enemy? I mean, that's a legitimate. I think that is a legitimate argument for the big baddie being a Loki variant uh, position that ultimately one of the things, one of the themes this show has kind of put up is that Loki is his own worst enemy. As a matter of fact, in the last episode, he had that one great line when he was talking to Sylvie and he says, I have betrayed everyone who has ever loved me. Yeah. My brother, my father, you know, stuff like that. I think that's a, a really important key line. And and may, again, I'm still leaning towards Kang. I, I, I think things like Kang's name being on the Avengers Tower. I think Alioth, who is directly connected to Kang, being in there. I believe the Void Palace and the Void Castle, which is directly connected to Kang, being there. I still lean towards Kang, but that Loki variant option is still very, very much on the table. And what you just said, always sketchy, is definitely one of the reasons why. All right, next up. 
uh, Eponymous writes, I don't know what y'all are talking about. I would totally bang the female version of myself. She would know how to bring the filthy. Yeah, I was saying, Rob, listen, regardless of anything else, I find this whole thing about Loki maybe falling in love with a version of himself to be kind of gross. I'm not I'm not going to lie. If they start doing it, I will only consider that a scene of masturbation, not a sex scene. It'll be a masturbation scene, having sex with oneself. I still, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's weird to me, but... I, while I think the dialogue and the chemistry have all been really good, I cannot get on board totally with this Loki and Sylvie thing because it is, it is Loki with Loki. It is two versions of himself falling in love with himself, which is, I guess, maybe the, the most Loki thing they could do. But I don't know. I still find it a little bit gross. What about you? Well, it isn't him, though. I mean, it's somebody who's from an entirely different universe that has a different background and they're not the same genetic material. And that female Loki, was she the daughter of a dark elf? You know, I mean, I, I think that the origins there, people can have totally different origins and still be like, I, I mean, it's not like it's even his own genetic material. I'll tell you a story, a quick story. When I met my 100% biological sister, I'd never met her before. And when I stepped off the plane in Hawaii, I looked at her and I was like, she's hot. That's my first thought. <laughs> yeah, and I'm well, like, that's I fine. know she was my sister. And intellectually, I but I'd never met her before. She's my 100% biological sister. So supposed to be gross. But I don't know her. I'd never met her. And my first thought was, she's a very attractive woman. I mean, obviously, uh, she's my sister. But, you know, it was the first thing I thought about. And, and I think in the case of Sylvie, they don't have any genetic material the same. They're totally different. They're from different universes. So I think they should bump chick a bump if they want to. <laughs> I still find it gross. All right. Next up, we got Scott Brown who writes, the trend of hating on creators because the content they worked on isn't what you wanted is to uh, to is to me is annoying me. Uh, whether it's Motu and Kevin Smith or that's Masters of the Universe and Kevin Smith or Star Wars and Ryan Johnson, it's not it's okay not to like something, but to hate bombing and harassing them is uh, is too far. Yeah, and and that is that is a very very troubling pattern in fandom the the entitlement that a lot of fans feel, and then if a piece of work comes out and you didn't like the work, I mean it's I saw one writer put it like this it's like going to a restaurant and you didn't like the steak that you ate and you go and stalk out the chef's house and you start damaging the the chef's car and you start trying to besmirch the the chef's you know reputation and personality and making comments about the chef's wife and blah blah all because you didn't like the steak they made it is one of the rotten sides of fandom it definitely is and there are definitely YouTube channels and, and blogs and podcasts that feed off of that and really stoke those fires. Um, and it, it is one of the dark, ugly sides of fandom. And it's it's something that hopefully will eventually just go away. I mean, the, the real you still see remnants of the total DC fanboy versus Marvel fanboy wars out there, but it's nowhere near as bad today as it was like four years ago, Rob. It, it, it's gotten better. I think people started to realize this is idiotic. And hopefully we will see that happen and this trend will get nipped in the butt. It's like, hey, listen, if you don't like a movie, cool. Like I hated Light Between Oceans and I hated um, uh, uh, Assassin's Creed. Am I going to start bashing on and attacking Michael Fassbender and because he was in two movies I didn't like? No. I, I mean, I'll say I didn't like those movies. I thought those movies were terrible. Okay, great. Now let's move on. Instead of like, now if Michael Fassbender ever puts out another movie, I'm going to organize a campaign to hate bomb his movie and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, look, idiots live among us. It, it is what it is. But hopefully, just like the Marvel and DC fanboys wars eventually calm down, hopefully this will calm down as well. Fingers crossed. Here's hoping the, the sanity in humanity prevails over the ignorance. Anyway, next up. Uh, Godzilla 2000 writes... Um, hey, John Rob, I just wanted to give a shout out to one of my favorite 1990 movies in the line of fire with Clint Eastwood or is the Secret Service agent. Yes. Uh, Rene Russo and the best of all, John Malkovich is one of his best and most chilling performances. Thanks for all that you do. Rob, I don't know if you ever saw in the line of fire, but dude, dude, that, come on now. that scene where Malkovich is like putting the gun together. It's like, ah, and just so for those of you who don't know. Clint Eastwood plays an aging Secret Service agent, and I believe he was on, I think it was Kennedy. He was. So he was like the Secret Service agent 
he was on duty when Kennedy got assassinated. And he's like, that's always ate at him. That was on his watch that Kennedy got assassinated. And now there's a plot where Malkovich is trying to kill the current president and like Lee Woods is getting ready to retire. And he's like, I'm not going to let another president die. Anyway, it's really good. Rob, what did you think of that film? Dude, I just got that movie in 4K. Of course you I, did. I love, love In the Line of Fire. I, I think, I mean, Clint Eastwood to me in The Line of Fire and Unforgiven, two huge career highlights that came out within the same few years of one another. Man, In the Line of Fire, Wolfgang Peterson. In the Line of Fire, John represents a powerhouse studio movie, the likes of which they don't make anymore. You know, and and it was, I, I don't know why, but I always think of In the Line of Fire in the same light as, um, uh, um, you know, you can't handle the truth. Um, a few good men. A few good men. I don't know why. I think like that to me is a great, perfect studio movie double feature. P really well written scripts. Aaron Sorkin wrote a few good men. Great stars, great actors, and it just a great, compelling story. And man, do I love that movie! I'm uh, watch it again now. Speaking of the director Wolfgang Peterson, because when I think of him, uh, I always think of Outbreak, that one he did with Dustin Hoffman. Uh, I, I, I love that movie, but he did like Das Boot, which was like, is an iconic all time iconic film. He did enemy mine, which I love enemy mine. By the way, that one Star Trek, the next generation episode was basically based on enemy mine in many yep. ways where Picard and the alien are down in the world. What was it Hirak and Gerard at Tanagra? I can't remember yeah. the exact line. It was something along those lines. He did air force one. Um, yeah, I mean, he just did a lot of great stuff. So definitely one you should absolutely, absolutely check out. All right, next up, uh, we go uh, also from Godzilla 2000. Hello, John and Rob. I was wondering if one of y'all have checked out Godzilla singular point yet. It's up Rob's alley and it's probably my second favorite, uh, Rewo Godzilla project after the excellent Shin Godzilla team Mecha Godzilla. I've never seen it. I have also never heard of it. Godzilla singular point. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not terribly interested in Godzilla animated stuff. I've checked out a few things. They've never really been my cup of tea. Um, so I have not even heard of this. Rob, have you seen or heard of Godzilla singular point? And Rob, we lost Rob. Rob disappeared. I don't know where Rob went. His uh, thing just sort of froze there. So let me see if we can get him back. Give me a second. I will see if we can get Rob back here. Godzilla singular point. I'm uh, ringing him now. I don't know if his inter his internet goes out sometimes. Normally I would just move on, but I really I really want to see if he can answer this one. Okay, he's not answering. Okay, let, we'll keep an eye on things to see if he comes back in here or not. Uh, I'm getting a Rob is not available. His internet may have gone out again. Anyway, we will come back to him. If, if Rob is able to pop back on here, we will come back to him in just a minute. All right, let's keep moving on here. Next up, we've got uh, Anton Riley who writes, that Encanto trailer looks beautiful animation-wise. Got me excited. Gives me Coco vibes. We'll definitely go watch this if it comes out in theaters. Yeah, I, I've, I've got to say, I didn't love the trailer. I'll be honest with you. I am I am finding that um, that trailers from Pixar are often not that good. That Pixar trailers are often not that good. Like, I didn't like the trailers for the first Coco. Well, I didn't dislike them, but I didn't think the trailers for Up were all that great. I didn't think the trailers for WALL-E were all that great. But I absolutely adore all those. Rob, we were just talking about uh, that new uh, Pixar film, Encanto, trailer that came out. Rob is now back yes. with us, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back, Rob. Um, it was so weird because I could hear and see you, but I, you couldn't, like, no, I don't I know why you, I froze. You, yeah. But you're back now. Um, what did you think about the trailer? I, again, I agree. I think it's got Coco vibes to it, and I loved Coco. But yeah, the trailer, like many Pixar th films, the trailer didn't super excite me, but it does look beautiful. Rob, what did you think about that trailer? I thought it looked great. You know, look, for me... <sighs> I'll watch anything that Pixar makes. I mean, I made the mistake, John, of not going to see Coco in the theater. So good. And man, man, when I finally picked up the Blu-ray, I was blown away 
at how beautiful that movie is. I mean, Pixar, to me, is one of the most reliable entertainment companies that's ever existed. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm being reminded by people in the live chat that it's it's – there's so there's so much overlap that I sometimes forget because there is a lot of overlap with the two companies. Pix it's technically a Disney animation film, not a Pixar film, which again they share a lot of the same leadership and people. But you're right, it is a, it is technically a Disney animation film, not a Pixar film. But that's important to point out. Rob, b before you dropped out there, we were talking about that new Godzilla Godzilla Singular Point. Um, I have not seen or heard of it. Not really interested in it at all. Have you seen or heard of this thing yet? Well, I would imagine Godzilla, Godzilla Singular Point is the new uh, Godzilla anime that came out. Uh, it's a new, it's a series, and I have not seen it. Um, it, I think it's like thirteen episodes, maybe, but I haven't seen it yet. And I think it's on Netflix now, but I'll definitely watch it. I like the other Godzilla anime series that was streaming. That. Um, uh, a lot of people that didn't like it, I thought I, it was really cool. You're talking about the one where and, like it, they, they time travel, like there's a thing in the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, did the, not like it. I thought it was dumb, to be honest with you. I, uh, I didn't like it in the least. And then, dude, our the viewer talked about Shin Godzilla. Shin Godzilla rules. I know you love that. Yeah, I know you that. Love was the that. last Toho God, man in suit Godzilla, even though it's CG Godzilla. It was a Godzilla movie told from the point of view of basically FEMA. And Godzilla yeah. was like considered almost like a natural disaster. And I loved it. I thought it was great. All right. Next up, we've got Kenna who writes one of two. Hey, John and crew. I hope you're all well. Based on what we've seen, can old man Loki could face off against Wanda? Illusions and reality warping are different, but the power scale of creating a small town and the entirety of Asgard are too. Especially since old man Loki has access to the powers of all the other Lokis as well, as established in this past episode. Thanks for your efforts, especially when technology throws you a curveball. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, thank you for that, Kenna. It's Listen, Rob, I I've been talking a lot, and I don't know if you were on the show here for that for, for one of these, but I've been talking a lot lately about one of the, it, probably Loki is the biggest example of Marvel never really being consistent with how powerful is Loki? Like how powerful right. is he? Cause sometimes they hint at being incredibly powerful. Remember he, he went toe to toe with captain America and, and basically won that fight. He went toe to toe against Thor and, and came close to winning in the original Thor movie, he and Thor went toe to toe. He is a god of Asgard and frost giant of Jotunheim all at the same time. We see him, you know, stopping a building, like incredible telekinetic powers. A building is falling on him and he just stops the building. Yet he gets into a little scuffle with two little guards on a train and they throw him off the train like Danny DeVito tossing mama from the train. I mean, they're really, really inconsistent. I think watching this episode when he sees Richard E. Grant like pulling that thing of recreating Asgard itself and Loki looks at him and says, I think we're more powerful than we think. I'm like, you think? I mean, right. I, I don't know. How powerful, not in the comics, but in the MCU, how powerful do you think Loki actually is? Well, I think it really depends. Like, you know, if he's changing universes, maybe his powers fluctuate depending on what reality he's in but i think loki's probably very powerful in our universe uh or or in what would you call it the prime universe i guess our when i say our universe i mean the main mcu but it probably fluctuates but i think he's pretty damn powerful it'll be interesting to see if they flesh that out a little bit more or maybe if we By have the way, I, as an aside john I just looked up this Godzilla singular point, and it says that episode two, this is the first thing it says, Goro pilots Jet Jaguar into battle against Rodan. I'm in. That's all <laughs> That's I can all tell you. you. I read that, know. I'm like, I'm in. That's all I need to know to watch this show. Jet Jaguar and Rodan, come on. Let me ask you this. With Loki, what do you think the chances are that we get a Wanda- and Thor kind of ending because we get to the end of Ragnarok. He's talking to Odin. Are you the God of hammers? You're more powerful, maybe even more than me. And then the lightning through his eyes with Wanda getting to the end. She has the awakening that she is the Scarlet witch and super big power. What do you think are the chances that in this final episode of Loki, we get one of these 
massive power-up moments for Loki where he like comes into his own, or do you think they're going to go in a different direction? No, I honestly think that the whole point of this series was to reestablish Loki as a as a prime heavy hitting villain in the MCU. To to villain. now that he's more self yeah now that he's more self actualized than ever, he he's let's call him an antagonist. I think that he will be fulfilled or fill he will be he will have more glorious purpose than ever before at the end of his show. <laughs> reestablishing him as somebody to be feared. All right, let's move on. Next up, Justin Danford writes, one of five. I feel Loki is better in concept than in execution. I blame the script, post-New York Loki, acting like Ragnarok Loki without the development. Oh, I disagree. That I 100% disagree with. They actually put him through different things to bring him to that point in a more accelerated way. But I definitely think they did that part right, at any rate. Um, Without the development, uh, wavering Loki power levels, that's always been a problem with Loki. I agree with that. A glaring plot hole with Loki slash Sylvie Nexus on Lamentus. They They still need to explain that, so let's not call it a plot hole yet. Hard to like Sylvie. I kind of agree with that. Uh, The great episode one and trailer seem to promise a time hopping bromance between Mobius and Loki. When those two are together, the show sings. I completely agree. But five episodes later, this relationship has been vastly underused to the show's detriment. I agree. Uh, A time hopping buddy cop, uh, buddy cop romp where Mobius, Loki hunt rogue Lokis to the betterment of the multiverse, allowing Loki to have a Christmas Carol revelation, catching up with him in infinity war Loki right before the rug is pulled out with the big bad reveal. Uh, would have made for a much more enjoyable show. What we have gotten narratively instead does not seem uh, executed to Marvel quality. Take away the Marvel branding, polish or budget. I feel you're left with a throwaway Doctor Who season. I hope the finale proves me wrong. Save us, Jonathan Majors. You're our only hope. And for those of you who don't know, Jonathan Majors is, of course, the actor from um, Lovecraft Country who's going to be playing Kang. So we'll see if that happens. I can't completely dis. I mean, I disagree with a number of your things in there, but I, I, but I also agree with a number of the things in there. Loki to me is look. We have had five episodes. Three I consider to be quite good. Two I consider to be quite not good. Uh, five, five wasn't bad. I, I should say five wasn't bad, but it was it was still overall disappointing to me, despite the fact that I had some really cool highlight moments. Three was definitely bad. So they're barely over five hundred on their episodes, and it's gonna. Rob, I don't think we've gone into a finale yet of an MCU show that so much is riding on the finale because but before we got to the finale of WandaVision, I was done. This is a great show and I love it. It didn't matter what happened in the finale. I loved that show. And it turns out I actually quite liked the finale, but that was great. But even if I hated the finale with that with the burning heat of a thousand suns, overall I was already completely on board with the show. I loved the show. Falcon, the Winter Soldier, I was like, I really like this show. But no matter what happened in the finale, I was, I could have loved the finale. I still would have just ended up kind of really liking the show. I could have hated the finale. I still would have just really liked the show. I find so much is riding on this last episode of Loki. Because I yeah. really think, I feel like it still can go either way. Because if this finale disappoints me like episode three did, like episode five did, then my overall impression of Loki is going to be... Don't know if I liked it overall. If, if it's a great finale, it easily pushes me towards, yes, I, I liked this show, but I didn't love it, right? I just feel like a lot is riding on this finale. How are you feeling going into the finale tomorrow night? I feel the same way as you do because I think that this show has set up a huge expectation, not just amongst us, the fans, but also as far as the show is going. I mean, it has a lot to sort of wrap up. What What... What is the point of this whole show? Where what is the disposition of the TVA as far as the Marvel Cinematic Universe is concerned? What has Loki learned? Where is Loki left after all this? What is at the end of the rainbow through is that Chronopolis? Is that the end of time? Will we find out who's running the TVA? I mean, there's so much this episode has to accomplish. And I'm I'm curious and where where are they going to leave things? I mean, the TVA is such an out there concept and it's it's now exploded an area of the MCU we, that didn't exist previously. But knowing that the TVA is out there, how does that affect the rest of the MCU? Does any, Is anyone else going to find out about this or is it just going to stay in its own little pocket universe? But I mean, if Loki gets out of there and starts interacting with the rest of the MCU, what does that mean? 
And what does it have to do with the multiverse of madness? You can't have a movie called the multiverse of madness and not involve the TVA. What does it all mean? Or can you? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm John. I'm my expectations. I'm expecting a lot. Maybe I'm setting myself up for disappointment. It, it, they need to deliver. Like, like I said, for me, they're three and two out of their five episodes. Three really quite good. Two questionable to not good. They need yeah. to stick this land. I didn't feel that way about WandaVision. I didn't feel that way about Falcon Winter Soldier. They have to nail this ending. They have to make yes. this whole show worth it. And I think they can. I'm excited about it. But the stakes are high. The stakes are high here. So we'll see how that goes. The highest. Uh, next up, we've got Tron who writes in. I want to be excited for Space Jam 2, but with every trailer and clip, i.e. the Porky Pig rap and Matrix scene, my excitement drops more and more and more. The marketing's been terrible, but still going to go see it, and I hope it's great. Will you be seeing it? I'll be seeing it. For sure I will be seeing it. Am I expecting to have a great time? No, I'm not. I, 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 I agree with you, Tron. I think the trailers have been, at best, lackluster. A few cute things here and there, but honestly... I'll be frank with you. If it wasn't my job to see these things, I wouldn't be seeing this movie. I really wouldn't. Just as a movie fan, if I didn't have to review this and at least talk about it to a degree, I wouldn't be seeing this movie. The marketing has been that bad to me, so we'll see where it goes. But you're not alone, You're not alone, Tron. All right, Tron also writes, Also, I just realized in 2022, we have four MCU films, Doctor Strange 2, Thor 4, Black Panther 2, and The Marvels. Four DC films, Batman, Black Adam, Flash, Aquaman 2, and two Sony films, Mobius and Spider-Verse 2. Ten big comic book films next year. It's crazy. I can't wait. And Tron, you're not even you're not even including the MCU shows on Disney Plus. You're not even including those. And and the other things that are coming out on HBO Max. You're not even counting that. There's a lot of comic book content coming out. A lot of it. And with the feature film stuff like that, it is a good time to be uh, a fan of this material. So there is an awful lot coming. I worry a little bit too much, maybe. I worry there might be too much. But for now, I'll just be excited that there's a lot of good things coming. All right, next up. Uh, we've got Jerome who writes, Are superheroes wrong for not telling their loved ones their secret identity? And do the loved ones have a right to get mad when they find out or are told the truth? Or are they selfish for getting mad uh, because of everything the hero goes through? It's a good question. I, I Look, it's one of those things, Rob, where I think like a lot of real situations in real life where both sides would have a legitimate point. Yes. I get it from the hero's point of view that I need to protect you. If you knew who and what I really was, it could endanger you. And I get that. That's a valid point and that makes sense. However, if I'm the other person in that, it's like, Let's say it's a spouse, especially a boyfriend, girlfriend, or lifelong best friend, whatever. It's like, dude, basically a huge part of our relationship, whether it's a friendship relationship or romantic relationship, has been a lie. You have hid something incredibly huge and important about you and who you are from me that in a regular average friendship is fine, but whether it's a deep romantic relationship or a lifelong deep friendship or whatever, I could totally see that that person would then feel betrayed. That feel like yep. I, I've been in a relationship, I've had this relationship with you, and it's all been based on lies. And and so it's one of those things where I totally get it. I do. I, I get it from both sides. So I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer to that question. Rob, I don't know. It's it's the it's the classic superhero problem. But what do you think about it? <laughs> well, I, I you know. I would take it on a case by case basis because like you astutely pointed out a lot of the time a secret identity exists to protect loved ones so no one else can be used as either uh, I mean imagine if you're Superman and you have everybody wanting to come after you or Batman if someone knew who you were your loved ones would be at risk and they would be a vulnerability and they would be in danger all the time. And if you're putting yourself out on the line, I think it really depends. I mean, even if somebody knew who you were, it would still be it could be a risk to them and a risk to you. So it's a trade off. It depends. However, on the other on the flip side of that, if you're in a relationship with somebody, say, I don't know, a significant other, a love, a lo your lover, your spouse or whatever, and you didn't tell them. Well, that could be considered a big betrayal because shouldn't that be the one person that you can confide in? And if there's something that you if you can't confide in somebody, what else can you not confide in them about? And that 
can be very destructive to a relationship because they can't trust you. And to have a kind of a relationship like that, you need somebody. Trust is the most important thing. And if someone can't trust you about one thing, they can never trust you unless they're the kind of person that could agree to, to allow you that, that part of their life, your life that you're not going to share with them. But that's, 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 that's a pretty special person. I don't know if, I don't know if I could be that kind of person. I'd want to know. Yeah. So you get some superhero stuff where it's like they, they, there's like one or two people know, but then you get like the CW shows where every episode, five more people find out who the hero is. So I don't know. There's, there's, there's different ways to do it. All right. Next up, Andy Hong writes one of four. Hey, John, my question isn't a film slash TV related one. It's heavy. So if you want to disregard it, I'm okay with it. I'm just happy to support you. It's about life. You seem to have a careful and thoughtful approach to it. And you've also acquired a diverse set of knowledge, uh, knowledge in theology, law, filmmaking in your life. You're also twice my age. So I figured uh, you'd have more life experience, thus more ideas and opinions on it. In the past 16 months, I've lost my faith in humanity. Uh, how do you maintain yours? I'm happy uh, things are opening up again, but in the past year, I've come across people who are okay with 1% of people dying to COVID because it doesn't affect them. And that belief usually stems from those people uh, being too young and fit. First, it's not uh, ac actually 1% as it's much more complex than that. Second, uh, humoring the 1% notion, that means that these people are okay with over 3 million people dying in the U.S. I'm surprised how many of these people exist and have felt disappointed and jaded by them. Well, look, I, I'm not going to get into any sort of political discussion here um, um, Andy, so I, I'm not going to get anything, but yeah, yeah, it, it, it is, it is often confounding to me and often makes me lose a lot of hope in people when I see the blatant willful ignorance there is out there, like just blatant willful ignorance. Um, you know, I, I compare it a lot to when I see things, one that I won't use as a, as a, as a political thing, but just as an example, when you look at flat earthers, like, <laughs> and if, if if anybody's watching this as a flat earther and you feel offended by that, I don't I don't care. Um, when you look at flat earthers who reject all real science, knowledge, logic, everything, and they will stream to these fanatical, ridiculous pseudoscience things and these ridiculous YouTube videos that they, they rely on and blah, blah, blah. And you see other more important issues in life being treated the same way. It, it, to me, it, it, yeah, it does. It does hurt my hope in humanity. It does. But you also got to remember there are more people who are sane. There are more people who believe in logic and truth and facts and science and things like that, they outnumber the, those who don't. And so you just have to remind yourself of that a lot. You just got to remind yourself of that a lot, even though it, it does become very, very, very disheartening. It does. Um, and and it, it's very difficult when you just, in general, it's one thing when you lose hope in certain people. It's another thing when you find yourself losing hope in humanity. And that, that can be a tough place to be. And I, I completely understand that. And it's just, you got to remind yourself that, that, that good outnumber the bad. And you just got to remind yourself of that and move forward. Anyway, just my thought on that. Just my thought on that. All right, next up. Uh, Grizzlies writes, Spider-Man's surprising appearance in the new What If uh, trailer got my friends looking dumb when they said he'd never appear. Sony has him. Lest we forget, uh, What If is a TV show. Marvel slash Disney has owned the TV rights to Spider-Man since 2010. That, and you also have to understand that Sony and Marvel have a very, you know, for the last number of years, they've been operating under a very specific new agreement where a lot of these things were probably already uh, agreed upon and contracted and things like that. So I wouldn't be surprised at all that under that agreement, there would be like, yeah, that Sony probably gave their sign off anyway, even though they probably didn't even need to. So it's, you know, it's Robert Meyer Burnett always says, it's not what you deserve. It's what you negotiate. And it's, <laughs> it's probably a case there. So Rob, yeah, I was, I'm not at all surprised to see that there's going to be a Spider-Man thing in there. Spider-Man is a part of the MCU. I'm not surprised at all that number one, Sony would permit it. And even if they weren't permitted, they probably have the rights to do it anyway, because it's probably in the contract. I don't know. How do you see that? Well, just like you said, I mean, Sony had to agree to it, but you know, it's advertising for the new Spider-Man movie. Why wouldn't you want it to be in there? I mean, of course you want it to be there. They've once they've allowed 
they, they've allowed Spider-Man to be in the MCU. They'll allow him to be in the MCU. And I'm sure when when Marvel had to ask Sony or get permission, like, hey, we want to have him in this what if show. I'm sure I'm sure Sony's like, great, do it. It can only help us all. So I, I think that's probably how that worked. Um, and I can't wait, dude. I can't wait to see what if it looks like it's a hoot. I'm not that excited for it. I'm not. No. Oh no, man. No, 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 that is Star Wars Visions, dude. Come on. Yeah, I'm not that excited for that either. <laughs> it's oh. it's weird. Now that's not to say that once I start watching it that I may not love it. But yeah, I, right. I'm not going to lie. I'm not. I'm not all that stoked for what if or visions. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Mm. We'll see. I'll, I'll get. I'll definitely give both of them a chance, though. All right. Uh, next up, what do we got here? We've got uh, Christ Hannah. Just steps. Uh, just send in a twenty dollar tip to send in a twenty dollar tip. Thank you so much for that, Hannah. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, last question of the day comes to us. And uh, by the way, the reason I'm saying last question of the day, you guys might be looking saying, John, usually the show's another half hour. True, but I have a dentist appointment. Uh, you guys know I had some dental work done. Uh, I had to get a wis- an infected wisdom tooth taken care of. I got to go back for my follow-up appointment. And my dentist's office right now is an hour away. So I, I got to go take care of that. Anyway, so for today, our final question of the day uh, comes to us from an anonymous viewer who tips in like $20. Thank you, anonymous. And they write, hey, guys, something just doesn't sit right with me for the season two issue of Lovecraft uh, Country. For instance, I'm CEO over everything Warner Brothers, DC, HBO Max. I'm Mr. When, oh, I'm Mr. When I walk by, you better act like you're working, uh, like you better act like you're working, shot caller. Uh, This place. If someone comes to me and says, sorry, we can't think of anything for Lovecraft Country season two, my response wouldn't be no problem. Let's just scrap it, especially when we've lost so much money these past few years and tarnished uh, our reputation in the process. I understand there's more great books written by the author creator of the series. Why not just go to the next one? Any thoughts on the reasoning why? Well, I mean, you also have to be concerned, Rob, with quality control. You can't just, yeah. especially if you're HBO, because HBO has become known as the gold standard. They are better than Disney plus better than Netflix better than Amazon Prime. To me, HBO is the gold standard of creating excellence in original content. They're the best. And to have that reputation means you cannot just say, ah, just crank something out and throw it out there. That's not what they have traditionally done, and it's not what I want them to do. And yeah, if creators come and say, listen, we are having, this is what we've come up with, and then you look at it and say, you're the boss and you look at it and you say, mm, I don't think this is great so far. And they eventually say, listen, we're having trouble really come up with something that would be a really great, worthy follow-up season. Maybe this and maybe this. And they show it to you and you go, eh, nope, we're not there. Then if you're HBO, you actually do more damage to yourself if you just crank something out and throw it out there than if you just say, we're ending it after season one. Now, listen, I'm not happy about there not being a season two. I'm not happy at all. I really liked Lovecraft Country a lot, and I was looking forward to season two. But if they, both the creators and the and the bosses say, we're not satisfied with the concepts we've come up with or that we've seen yet, and we refuse to just crank out whatever shite we come up with, then while I'm not happy, I'm okay. I, I get it. You want to maintain that excellence reputation because you lose your reputation real fast, Rob. You can lose yep. that reputation real damn fast. And if they're really concerned about that and they want to put premium on that, while I'm not happy, I respect it. I don't know, Rob, what's your take on that? Well, I agree. I mean, Lovecraft Country, they adapted the novel and the novel was finished. As far as I understand, it was done as a limited series and they did what they said they were going to do. And it might have been a hit and it might be great. But I think that, you know, like you just said, unless they have a really good idea and they know where they want to go, uh, get out while you still can. I mean, it wasn't, it was done as a limited series. So it wasn't like that they planned it. This could go to a seven year stretch. It wasn't like that. And I think if they don't have a reason to move forward, like going to another book, it's not like that's a whole different deal. You have to make a whole, you have to renegotiate. You have to go. It's not like when you buy one Stephen King book to adapt, you don't get Stephen King's entire library. You know, it's still you'd have to start over from scratch. What is it we're making? 
unless I'm not sure if Lovecraft Country and the books carry on as a series with the with the same characters moving forward. I don't know if, how that works. Um, but I like you just said, I, I agree with everything you said. All right, guys. And with that down, that'll do it. For today's installment of the John Campus Show, once again, we have to cut today's show a little bit short because I have to go to a dental appointment. My apologies for that. But thank you guys for taking parts of your day to hang out with uh, hang out here with us. Special thank you to Robert Meyer Burnett for bringing his glory and goodness. And a special thank you to all of you guys who sent in these live comments and questions. Number one, because he gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. Now, with Robert Meyer Burnett being here, I'll let you guys know that we still have a bunch of questions that we're behind on. But don't worry, Robert Meyer Burnett himself, special treat for you guys, is going to be doing a big monster companion video, and he's going to get us all caught up on all the outstanding questions that we still have to come. So if you sent one in and you haven't seen it addressed yet, don't worry, Robert Meyer Burnett is doing that video today, and we'll have that up tonight for you guys to see. So, And then, of course, Robert will be back again tomorrow on the John Campus Show. But Rob, in the yes, meantime, will. where can people follow you and all your greatness online? Well, you can follow me, find me on Instagram under my name, Robert Meyer Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM, which, by the way, they said I can't be a verified blue check mark today. I don't know why. I guess I'm not good enough. And you can also find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. All right, Rob, thanks for being here. And again, thank you to all of you guys for being here. That'll do it for us for now, guys. Remember to do the four main things. Stay smart, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and please take care of the people around you. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends. Bye-bye.